thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, we're really excited today, uh, not only because the subject matter is really interesting, um, but also because we get to welcome back one of our alumni fellows. So um, Rama, back 10 years ago, was a fellow here with the center. Um, and so we we're catching up a little bit about the center and what's happening and ta talking things. But you know, you're in for a treat. This is going to be a really interesting um, conversation. And as you know, kind of one of the things we, we talked about a little bit is this merging of the physical and the digital via a lot of different means. Today you're going to get to learn a lot more about that, and HP is certainly one of the leading kind of companies making that come to life. So um, I won't go into too much detail. I know you've got a little bit about where your journey is going, but um, please join me in welcoming back to Tuck, Rama. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Patrick. It's exciting to be back. It's been 10 years. So it's seems like it's about the same, but a lot of things have changed for the better. Uh, as Professor Taylor was telling me right there, uh, it's uh, definitely not the stress of exams and assignments, so it's, it's quite nice. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about a few things today. I'm going to start off with my journey post talk. Then I'm going to do a um, quick look back at HP and then bring fast forward it to today, tell you about the strategy of HP today. and what the current portfolio is. Immediately after that, I'll look at the megatrends that we look at, what are the opportunities in the market, and then I'll get into blended reality and then the two businesses, 3D scanning and 3D print, and then we'll end with Q&A. All right, so my journey. Uh, it's not been a straight line. That's what this is supposed to depict. I started off at John Deere right after Tuck, and the reason is I wanted to do general management, and um, I wanted to go to a ro leadership rotation type of program, and John Deere has a really good one. And the other thing was I didn't really know much about ag. My background was all in computer engineering. I worked at Intel before Tuck. So uh, this was a good way for me to see if I really learned something or if I'm just going to go back and become a, uh, an engineer with a spreadsheet or an engineer with a slide. So it was a very interesting journey. I was there for two years. First year, I was in Moline, Illinois, which is their headquarters. And there, my goal was to look at new opportunities coming into the company, then create business cases around them, pitch them to a council of VPs, and they would fund it or not fund it and go through a stage gate process till it becomes something ready to become mainline product. It was not just product. It was also business models. One of the business models I pitched was how does a company that sells $100,000, $200,000 machines sell in a Asia or Africa. And my idea essentially was stitch the value chain, don't just sell the machine, don't just offer credit, stitch the value chain with NGOs and governmental agencies. And that got accepted as a corporate strategy, and then my next assignment was to go actually implement it in the field, which is a lot scarier than you might think, because it's a lot easier to stand up here and make some slides and talk about it, but then when you go on the field, it's a lot harder to do. That was a year in South Africa, working all across Africa. So it was a lot of learning on the ground, seeing how things really work. Then uh, there was a pull for me for personal reasons and other reasons to come back to the Bay Area. I, I used to work in California before Tuck, and I wanted to go back there and go back to tech. But I didn't want to go back to a very large company. I wanted to go to something that would be more challenging to some extent. The, but I learned later on, and I'll talk about HP, that large companies have their own challenges, right? It's not all easy either. Uh, but smaller companies have their unique challenges because they're trying to survive. I went to a company called Magellan, which is a GPS company. It was the first consumer GPS company. When I joined them, they were a $250 million company. Three or four years before I joined them, they were a billion dollar company. So they were in a rapid uh, kind of disruption. And that was all from smartphones because they made a GPS that people would put in their cars, and they were primarily a consumer business. The consumer business is super hard because why would somebody pay $200, $300 for a device when you can get it for free from your phone? So the, my role was twofold. One was to do corporate strategy a little bit in the beginning, and then I started taking a lot of functional roles. I did digital marketing. I had P&L for the dot-com business. I also did some BD. So it was quite an interesting role working for the CEO. You get to see a lot of things that you typically wouldn't see. So it was very fast learning. And my longer term goal was anyway to do general management. So it was a very good training. I did that for about three years. Then HP came calling. And I'll go into more detail in HP in a second. And at HP, initially, my role was to help launch this new product called Sprout. And it was um, the, the way it was pitched to me was it was going to revolutionize how computers work. Right? Today, computers work in the same 
kind of uh, basically it has keyboard and mouse. And then phones change it to a screen, but it's still this artificial barrier between the physical world and the digital world. And that's what the strategy was to try to change. And then we have gone through a bunch of learning and we have a lot of new products I'll talk about. So now let me start with HP. And I can talk about my journey and what I learned uh, later on in the QA. I won't belabor it too much. Uh, who here knows what this is? That's right, that's right. So uh, if you think about Silicon Valley and you think about the ethos of a startup, it's usually two guys in a garage, right? That came from here. This is the garage of the guy on the right. That's Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett is on the left. They started this company 80 years ago. Not many tech companies around that last that long. So there's a reason for that. The reason is the company keeps reinventing itself. So every time it feels like it's gotten stuck, it goes and does something dramatically different. And that's super important because it's very easy to have a flash in the pan or be in the right place at the right time and be successful. It's very hard to be successful in the long run, especially in tech where things change so dramatically. Their first product was, oh look, look at the startup capital, right? $538, that was everything they had. And they were making audio oscillators. They made a bunch of products, but audio oscillator was where they were successful. An audio oscillator is an instrument used to test sound equipment, sound system. And their first major customer was Walt Disney. And they were making this crazy movie called Fantasia. And what they wanted to do was simulate 3D surround sound in a theater and create this really immersive experience. And they needed this kind of equipment. And this machine was, uh, I think, $71.50. And they sold eight of those. And they're like, yes, we are in business, right? Now it sounds like a little thing, but they were a startup. They made the capital back. I think so, yeah. I think the eight can be replaced with a B. I think they still, they still made more than that. All right, so now let's look at what they have done since, right? We, still, we don't make any audio oscillators anymore, right? It, what we have done is we've done a lot of new things. The first desktop computer, uh, one of the first laptops, the first scientific calculator, each one has its own story. We did a lot of things on printing, and we dominated that market. And then recently, the things in orange I'm going to talk about later a little bit. That's the Sprout. That's what I came into HP for. And then 2016 was the actual unveiling of Jet Fusion, which is a 3D printer. Those are the two things I'm going to talk about. But I have obviously skipped a lot of years in the middle. And, uh, but just to show you like how big tectonic changes can happen within a large company. And they were quite successful when they were in the desktop computer business, but then the, did the calculator. They were quite successful there, but then they still reinvented and did the laptop business. They had nothing to do with printers, and then they did printers, right? So there are a lot of things that are coming brand new, and why, and so on, there are different reasons, but we can get into those later. All right, so the, I'll bring you up to where we are now. There are two leading franchises today. One is print. The other is personal system, personal system is PCs. And the one on the top right is uh, the Sprout, the one black. That's a version two, the commercial version of it. Okay, and then services solutions layered in. I'll, um, in terms of giving you a perspective of what this business looks like, imagine every second there's 1.7 PCs, HP PCs shipped every second of every day. And in that same second, one printer gets ship, shipped, right? So it's, imagine the scale of operations that needs to happen. So the strength of the company is go-to-market, and operational excellence. That's super important. Now, how do you go from there to being super innovative? Right? Those sometimes can be opposing poles. But you have to do both. Otherwise, you will be stuck on the left side of that innovation chart. And what, one other point is, uh, in every business we compete, we want to be the number one or number two, or we don't compete in those markets. And we're always looking for profitable, uh, profitable pro um, profitable segments. If it's not profitable, it's just for the sake of revenue, we don't do it. Revenue, uh, this is after split. We used to be combined with another company called HPE now. And at that time, we were a $100 billion company. Now we're a $59 billion company. Uh, about 55,000 employees. Lots of patents, lots of countries of operations. Strategy, three main pillars, right? Currently core, which is a very, very big part of our business. Almost all revenue and profit comes from the core. But then we want to aggressively defend, aggressively protect that business, but we also want to grow into adjacencies, natural adjacencies. And the print side, for example, we moved into 
we bought uh, the A3 print business from Samsung. So that's an adjacency to our regular printing business. In the personal system side, we are doing device as a service. So that's another adjacency. We sell devices as pay me money, here's a box, to device as a service where we do solutions, predictive analytics, all that kind of stuff. But now the third one is where we'll focus some of our time today, which is the future category. Future meaning category creation. This almost has nothing to do with the strength and competencies we have on the left. So that's the more scary part, but that's also the more exciting part because that, that's where a lot of the market is growing really fast, right? The core business is flat to in slow decline, whereas the future business is growing 11, 12%. So that's where you want to be. And there are the two things I'm going to talk about, 3D printing and then immersive categories where in, within which 3D scanning falls. All right, so quickly I'll show you, I'll rush through this just to give you a flavor of the product. This is the core business for printers, a lot of different, like, as you might imagine, a market that's been there for a while, you're, you're going to be doing smaller changes, right? These are not big leaps. You're going to do more and more customize, customization for your specific customers. Similarly on the commercial side. And then a few of the things, like commercial printing, for example, is um, slowly declining because people don't print so much anymore. But then on the other side, there's a lot more customization. There's a lot more things on graphics, a lot more things on textiles. New opportunities constantly opening up where we can use our older strengths to expand in adjacency. Then on personal systems, which is what we call our PC business, every year we do new firsts and bests, right? But again, like I said, these are not major tectonic changes, right? These are, we want to be aggressively first or two in the market, so we have to continuously keep doing new things. And some of the newer businesses at the bottom, like we did a, we made gaming into a almost a billion dollar business. Uh, it was a relatively small business just a few years ago. So this is a natural adjacency where we can be super strong. All right, so mega trends. What are the mega trends? So mega trends, I uh, know every company looks at them. These are large socioeconomic global trends, right? These are, don't necessarily translate into what do I do tomorrow, but these are telling you what's going to happen in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Number one, rapid urbanization. What does that mean? More and more people like to live in cities. Uh, take, for example, 1992, there were only 10 mega cities. Mega city meaning a city with more than 10 million people. In 1992, 10. 2025, 40. So that's a big shift. The other shift, uh, now when people live in cities, obviously there's, there are different ways of servicing, what they expect, um, and so on. So next on demographics. Population is aging. People are, people are living longer. They're having fewer children. That means, in general, population is aging. When population is aging, then the services and the products you offer them have to be different. Take, uh, n let's see, 2025, there'll be more than 1 billion people who are aged 65 or more. Uh, that's a large population, and they're going to live longer. The other big trend, hyper-globalization. Any small change in any part of the world affects everybody. Everything is interconnected. Uh, 20, I think it's 2025 also, it, one of the things that we've seen is more than half of Fortune 500 companies would be outside the U.S. And that hasn't happened before. Uh, it, a lot of the businesses, especially U.S. businesses, think all U.S.-centric and think about competition as U.S. competition. Maybe one or two in Europe, but more than half will be outside. So what do you do in that kind of thing? And then finally, which I highlighted in orange because I'm gonna, uh, our talk will be more around accelerated innovation. Think about any electronic device you have today. In 10 years, do you think it'll be 10 times better or 1,000 times better or will not exist? It probably will not exist. Things are changing all the time, right? Let's say you have a cell phone today. Maybe you don't need that anymore. You just wear some glasses or you put on contact lenses and you get everything you want. Or, or you just hear it. You don't really need a computer at home. You just talk to it, right? So these kind of things are very hard to predict. They're not linear, and they have huge inflection. The other thing happening is there are a lot of fundamental technologies like 3D print, AI, blockchain, those kind of things that are coming and converging and mixing and matching together and changing industries where nobody thought it would have anything to do with it. Like uh, take AI, for example, where it, it's going to intersect a lot of different businesses in a lot of different places. 3D print is going to intersect lot of the manufacturing space, which is considered as kind of stable industry, nothing's going to change there, but it'll completely change in the next few years. So it's, um, 
it's a very challenging market to be thinking about strategy. It's also a very interesting market because none of your standard frameworks will help because you don't know what you don't know. It, things happening really, really fast. Now we take those global trends and think about what are the market trends in the near term that we can see, what are the opportunities. One big thing, at least from HP's point of view, we have seen is that commercial and consumer worlds are kind of merging. We have a commercial business and we have a consumer business, and for a very long time, they were completely separate. Commercial people want security. They're fine with a thick, fat notebook. They're okay with that. They, it, it doesn't need to have long battery life. It just needs to have horsepower. On the consumer side, the opposite, right? It needs to be thin and attractive, but it doesn't need to have all the features. But those things are all colliding. And one of the reasons for that, uh, millennials, it's not necessarily a question of age, it's a thinking, it's a mindset. And by millennials, what we think about is people who are thinking about outcomes and experiences rather than products and services. When you think about it like that, then you have to design your products differently. You have to pitch your products differently. You don't just say, this has the fastest processor. What does it do? Right? That, that's more important. The other thing, mobility and security. On the commercial side, mobility was not super important in the past. Now everybody wants all their data everywhere, but they want it super secure. That's kind of a contradiction, right? I want to be able to access my company's internet right now, but then I don't want anybody else to see it. So that's a big challenge, because it's not just a network problem, there's also you can hack this, right? I stuck my USB, USB uh, drive in there. I don't know what's loading up there, right? So <laughs> I, I don't know that. But the, co the expectation for me is that the company will take care of it. I stick it in, if there's a problem, somebody will tell me. Either HP will tell me, Microsoft will tell me, or somebody else will tell me. But if not, I'm not happy. So that expectations are changing a lot on the mobility security side. Then capital expense. People, we, we were talking about that earlier. People don't want to spend a lot of money and get tied up with technology, which might be changing all the time. I talked about accelerated innovation. Why would somebody want to get locked into something for five years if they can go on a month by month basis or a year by year basis, right? Everything has to be offered as a service. Now that offers challenges to large established companies who are used to selling capital equipment. Your internal processes are not set up for that. Your financial flows are not set up for that. So you have to change a lot of things internally. It might seem obvious, but it's very difficult to do once your plane is already flying. You have to go change the wings, you have to change the pilot, you have to change the dashboard while it's still flying. And nobody should notice in the back, right? That's a very difficult thing to do. Then finally, blended reality, and I have one slide for that. So what does blended reality mean? It really is trying to remove this artificial barrier between creativity and productivity, between the physical world and the digital world. For example, if you want to do something with clay, but you also want it to be inside your computer so you can manipulate it and then get it back into a physical form. Right? A, lot of, a lot of designers think in actual three-dimensional things they can touch and feel, but a lot of the work has to be done on a computer. And you, you might notice that yourself, if you're a painter or an artist, you might, in the beginning, find it artificial to do that on a computer screen. Um, like for me, for example, I'm not a painter by any stretch, but I like to doodle on in my notebook. I like to write in my notebook. I remember that much better than if I write on a screen. I don't know why, because that's how I grew up, right? So there, there is this thing about physicality that's important. But then you also need digital tools, right? Uh, I'm sure people who do notebooks like you're doing, Patrick, you want this somehow to be there everywhere for you, but it's not. I lost my notebook recently and finally found it, but it was like, oh my god, right? Because everything was in there. So it, it's important that this uh, artificial barrier between physical and digital. And on the 3D side, you know, you can do sense, capture the 3D data, and then you can print on the other side and make it physical. You can have the best of both worlds. Now, I quickly a side track here, a tangent to some extent. These, uh, what I'm going to hear, uh, what I want to talk about here is how innovation happens. It doesn't happen, at least in my experience, it doesn't happen because some big strategist came out with, this is what we're going to do, and that's what happened. It almost never happens that way. It just happens through serendipity, accidents, and then because technology magically converges at the right place at the right time, and accidental meetings. Right? This, this is the Sprout product from left to right. This was the first iteration on the very left. So there was. Um, a distinguished technologist in our group, um, a brilliant engineer who came up with the idea of, I want to take my daughter's photos and be able to place them on a table and then be able to work on those on the table. I put the photo, I take the photo out, it's digitally here and I want to manipulate it and then hit go, right? 
I want to work with my finger. But that's very difficult to do because you can either do it on an LCD or you do it on a paper and then scan it, but it's not quite the same. So he invented that thing there where you can project, reproject things down. And he came from the printing world. He had the experience on flatbed scanning and that kind of thing. So it started with the 2D, and as it progressed, it morphed into doing both 2D and 3D, and then it added a computer to it, so it had the right compute power, and it was a vertically integrated full solution rather than a point solution that you attach to a computer. Then the mat on the right was also became inking. It, you can use a pen, so you can get much more precise. So none of that was planned out. If you had asked him five years prior to that, he would have thought it would be a much faster version of the thing on the left, but that almost never happened. All right, 3D scanning, big market. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on what 3D scanning is. And it's the main challenge with 3D scanning is it's been around for a while, but technology, like in terms of compute power, in terms of algorithms, were not quite there to make it mass adapted. And there was, no on, there was nothing on the other side. For example, if you could take pictures, but you can never really see them and never really print them, wh why would you take pictures? It's similar with 3D scanning. There was no real way to print it for commercial purposes. There was also very, very narrow use cases in the past. Now the use cases are opening up. The market is growing really fast. There are some very commercial type of use cases like reverse engineering metrology. There are some consumer-ish use cases like virtual reality where you can scan a whole home. There's also on the fitness, body, shoe sizing. We are, we are playing in the shoe business, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Then museum reproduction. So this, uh, and I haven't even listed half of the use cases, just some representative use cases. But think about 3D scanning. It's not much different than 2D scanning, which is you want to capture the physical world and represent it digitally. Right? What can you, what can you capture? Anything. But how do you use it? There are multiple use cases. That's why this is not by any means an exhaustive list. But these are the ones we are looking at right now. So in, in our group, the products we have are, these are the kind of the three big categories if you think about it. So the Sprout is the product I was talking about which has a computer and then um, a mat and I'll give a little bit of detail in a second. Main markets we're playing in is retail kiosk more as a collaboration and then manufacturing where you can use it as an AR thing, then in education where you use it as a 3D, uh, 3D ingestion engine. And then we have a standalone scanner which is taking the top part, the camera part of the Sprout, and then making it standalone. So if you want much more compute power, right? I'm trying to dictate how much compute power you need. But if you are working with high-end Adobe stuff or Autodesk stuff, you probably want a workstation, a high-end workstation. It doesn't make sense to put it in an all-in-one form factor, but if I, you can attach it to your monitor, it makes sense. And on the super high-end, more on the professional side, that's more like six, $7,000 for that projector and two cameras. There, you're doing reverse engineering, more commercial use cases. Then the bottom one is also interesting because there you're doing not super sophisticated 3D, but the main thing is you can get a capture of your feet, know how your foot looks, how you walk, what, where you put pressure, and then go into 3D printing an insole that is custom for you. So it's an end-to-end -end stitched solution. So we have different ways of thinking about 3D, right? You can do point products, you can do a fully integrated solution. On the bottom right, you'll see, this is Sprout. On the bottom right, you'll see how a quick 3D scan can be done here, right? Uh, it's an infinite loop, so you'll see it in a second. So you start with, you're slowly turning the thing under. It'll, it'll just create a full mesh for you, and now that's fully stitched. So it's actual full 3D representation, and you can, uh, it's like a mesh, all right? So you can actually print it, and it'll look exactly the same. But it's super fast. So this is to make 3D more accessible. A professional doesn't need to hold their hands and rotate it, right? They'll put it on a turntable and they want much more precision. But a normal creative person who just wants to inject 3D into their environment, you want to be able to do it super fast. And uh, here in this case, for example, the, the person has hands, right? Right, touching the thing, but the hands don't show up. Because that's, again, using algorithms to know that this thing is not moving, so I'm going to uh, subtract it. I won't go too much into detail here, but I'll skip it. I can talk about it later. Z3D camera, this is uh, a disembodied sprout. We take out the camera portion of it and stick it to a monitor. This is more for creative professionals, like I was talking about earlier, it's magnetically mounted. I'm gonna run a quick video here. I hope it works. All right, here we go. This looks like the same old routine, doesn't it? Not today. Today, the physical and digital worlds become one. This is the HPZ 3D camera. 
consider it a fast forward button to digital realism. Are you ready? Let's go. Watch this. Can you see that? It's capturing geometry, capturing texture in real time and removing hands all at once in minutes. It's as easy as recording video. This life is complex, organic, imperfect, and we strive for that realness in our digital world. This turns physical reality into the ultimate 3D digital palette. This is texture based on the real texture, physicality based on the real physical attributes. We're just accelerating the process. Richness, precision, control. We no longer have to start from scratch. 3D design meets 3D capture, and it's all right here in your workspace. You've never worked this way before, because there's never been a way to work like this before. Just here, what you saw was a lot of the creative people like to use the physical things that they have on the desk, and they want to inject, I want this color, I want this texture. But it's very difficult to do if you start from digital only, right? Like that uh, ram's head, for example. To do that by hand, you will, uh, this suggestion can be scary. Uh, <laughs> okay. Does it work? No. Okay. It's a lot easier to start from the physical world, ingest it, and then polish it up. So the RAM set was not super perfect for what that person wanted, but they had a base model. Quickly adjust, tweak a few things, and you saw they were using Adobe tools, right? We're not trying to reinvent new tools for these people because they know what tools they have, but making their flow seamless so that they don't have to go find a 3D scanner somewhere. It's a much more complicated process. Scan it, then import the file, and start to learn about how to do 3D, right? Here, it's, it'll uh, directly ingest it into Adobe tools, so you don't have to think about it. Like, I want 3D, you get 3D, done, you move on. So that's for Creative Pro, so this product is meant for them. Then we have more professional use cases. Here you see this frog. The, uh, the thing with this particular 3D scanning solution is that it's uh, very precise. This current version is about 100 microns of uh, resolution accuracy. What that means is it's, um, it can resolve your the width of your hair precisely. And it can do fingerprints precisely, like it can see every ridge and uh, every nook and cranny in 3D. Which is, a, which is a tough problem. There, there are other products like that out there, but they're more expensive. And our next one is going to be aiming at um, sub-50 micron accuracy. So there, there are a lot of use cases that uh, open up as you, as you improve accuracy, especially on the 3D print side. We're working with them on making their process better, making calibration better for them, making real-world production applications better for them with a 3D, a 3D scanner in the flow. Um, use cases. Um, Multiple use cases also here we touched upon a little bit. I'll run a couple of videos uh, specific to them. So one, museum and artifact. A lot of times they have some precious artifact. Maybe they have a plaster of it from a long time ago, and they want to put it on a website or re reproduce it so kids can touch and feel or people can see what they really are. But it's very difficult to do, or it's very expensive to do clay models, but it's a lot cheaper to do a 3D model if you can scan it. Um, I won't get into the technology, but you'll see it in the video. So let me just run the video here. The first one is an uh, archaeology use case. And I, I won't run the full video here, but I will just stop. Just, oh, wait. It's not a... My name is Stan Goff, and I'm the director of Archaeological and Historical Services at Eastern Washington University. Our program is a grant and contract funded research program conducting archaeological research primarily on prehistoric cultural material. My name is Julia Furlong. I am an archaeologist at Archaeological and Historical Services in Eastern Washington University. We use 3D scanning in our work. After we have excavated sites, then we will scan the artifacts and then use those scans to produce reliable, accurate measurements. The increased accuracy that we get with 3D scanning over the old way of doing it, manually with calipers, is primarily gained in eliminating the errors that, that come into play when you have different analysts trying to measure 
oddly shaped geometry. We can now take measurements at any point on the artifact, which is very, very different than trying to do that manually with calipers. This artifact was an antler core. I'll stop here. Uh, you saw um, while they were, they had taken the little flint piece and put it on a turntable and there was some light flashing on it. What it's really doing is the projector is flashing a pattern and two cameras are looking at the patterns. Uh, simplistically imagine straight lines being projected on a table. You expect them to be straight. But if there's an object in the middle, they look bent to a 2D camera. If you take a bunch of 2D pictures, you'll see that they're bent in certain ways and you keep changing the pattern. And you're, obviously there's IP in the minimal set of patterns so you can uh, figure out what is really there. And that's what's going on. So very high resolution cameras looking at patterns, how patterns are uh, distorted. This is called structured light scanning. It's one of the technologies. There are many 3D scanning technologies. This is the one we're using for this particular product. The one you saw in Sprout where we were using our, ha you were using your hands or with Z3D camera doing it really fast, that's a little bit different technology. But it also is structured light, but it uses infrared. You don't see it. Okay, one more example. This would be on would be from maybe some of you went to this school here. <laughs> My name is Daniel Houghton and I direct the Middlebury College Animation Studio. And just this past year is when we began incorporating the HP scanning into our workflow. One of the biggest missing pieces is how do you go from the concept of a character into a three-dimensional digital character that can be animated in your short film. And the scanner filled in that gap. So the scanner bar's got two cameras on it, each pointing in at the object, which captures the object from two angles at the same time. And what that allows is for us, with a single scan, to capture an object with enough fidelity that we can be over and done with it. It provides a high resolution mesh of anything you put in front of it. And for us, that lets us throw a clay object down on the turntable and within an hour or so, get a workable 3D mesh that we can start putting into our animation projects. Finally, the student who started the process by sketching with pencil and paper can then look at this cleaned up mesh and reposition the vertices, giving it one final pass so that the character once again looks like the initial drawing that began the whole process. So when the students sit down with the 3D scanner for the first time, they are genuinely excited. They get to see something they made with their hands uh, come to life on the screen in a way that they never have before. Sculpting an object with your hands creates an idea in your mind of what that object is. And to see that exact same object appear on the screen in a virtual space for the very first time is magic. They've seen something they made in the real world exist in the virtual world in a way that they never could before. So with the arrival of the 3D scanner, finally we were able to uh, begin with art first and wrestle with technology second. In that whole video, my favorite sentence is, begin with art first and wrestle with technology later. I think that's, that's the kind of what we want to achieve with blended reality. Whatever you're trying to do, do that seamlessly without any friction. Don't have to think about, what do I do now, right? That is what's super interesting here. Uh, it's not, about, it's not for this technology for the sake of technology. You're actually helping somebody accelerate their their creative process and not being like, okay, I'm a creative person, I don't know anything about technology, give it to somebody else. Okay, we can talk more about this at the end if you guys want, um, a little bit cognizant of time. Uh, this other one I briefly touched upon where on the, I, I'll just walk you through here, on, on the left top, you have uh, your feet being scanned, so it gives you a 3D image of your feet, but your feet might be exactly the same size and look and feel as my feet, but I might walk differently than you, and that's where a lot of the uh, posture and those kind of problems come in, running problems come in. So then we have a pressure plate from a partner on which you walk a few times, and that gives a profile of uh, where pressure is applied on your feet. And then that information is fed to either on the top, it's a actual shoe-making machine at a company called Desma that makes most of the machines on which shoes are made. 
you can, uh, that's a mass production type of thing, but you can tweak every individual shoe and then how do you track that information back and, uh, back and, uh, back and forth through the value chain. That's what we have done through a whole bunch of uh, partnerships that we have stitched together. Or you can just do a 3D printed one, right? So the 3D printed shoes are coming online, but lo for, for the next few years, almost all of the shoes will be made in the traditional process, but we also found a way to insert ourselves into there where customization of starting with shoes and then body parts and clothes and all is gonna come, where 3D print or 3D scanning has a big role to play. I'll get into 3D print. 3D print is a little bit uh, also an esoteric topic. It sounds like magic. Uh, it's like Star Trek, right? You walk up there, you open the door, and something magically appears. That, that's what it sounds like, at least to, to people I've talked to. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second and show a couple of videos. But the market is humongous, $12 trillion. This is like a consultant's dream, right? You can talk about large stamps, $12 trillion. Like you can't really get much bigger than that. But 3D printing today is a small portion of it. But even there, there are a few things we need to do to realize our potential. And th those are the ones on the top, which are called about unlocking the potential. And product capabilities. Today, uh, if you go into a factory floor and ask them to replace traditional methods like injection molding, with which a lot of plastics are done, the first thing they'll ask is, is it reliable? Is it consistent? The next thing they'll ask is, is it cheap enough? Is my cost per unit low? That's where material price comes in. You can have fancy materials, and they have fancy properties, but it's super expensive. It's double the cost per unit. Then material selection, there are thousands and thousands of materials available in an analog process, if you want to call it that. In a digital process, the selection is not that large. So HP is working on all of these three things, making the product uh, very reliable, either equal or better than the injection molding process on plastic side. Having material price down, we have some custom materials we work with, a lot of companies, and then having a lot of selection. Now once we do that well, the market can realize its potential in that little orange circle, but if we really want to, exp uh, yellow circle, but if it really wants to expand, then we need to do the bottom three. We need to do design for additive. What that means is when you're designing, let's say you have a complicated gear box, right? You might design each individual gear separately and you're trying to achieve a function. But with 3D printing, you don't have to worry about how it's gonna fit together. You can actually 3D print the whole thing all at once. So you, ha you can, create new form factors, create new physical properties with a lot less material. But most of the designers don't think like that because it was not possible to do it in the past. So if you think for 3D, then you will get even more value out of 3D printing. Then supply chain. Uh, today, most of the manufacturing happens in Asia, and then it's moved back and forth, right? Ideas come from here, maybe, or ideas come from there, but it, there's a lot of things that move around. But with 3D printing, you can do a lot more local batches, Right now, a lot of 3D printing is used for prototyping, but if you start doing mass production, then you can start rethinking about, I need to sell 10 million of this SKU, otherwise I won't make them, to I can make 100,000 of these and customize it for a specific customer segment and have the same cost per unit. That completely changes the supply chain. Then finally, standards and policies. A um, lot of you are probably too young to remember, but when cell phones came out, there were like 100 connectors 100 ways to charge the thing. There was no standardization whatsoever, and that's where a lot of money was made, right? So we don't want that kind of thing to happen here. Otherwise, the market just won't explode, unless you have, uh, and how do you communicate with each other, right? You take a standard from here, and you can apply it somewhere else, and it just works. So that's super important for innovation to happen. So we are working on all those three things. But the first, first act there, unlock, is super important. That's where all our energy is today. Like I said, our product launched 2016. Uh, this, this is the product line. The first two product lines are, one left one is more for production, the, uh, the middle one is for mass production. It's, uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but it can do a lot more things. And then the one on the, thir the third one is a color prototyping machine. So it's not one for mass production yet, but you can do color finally in plastics. And then the rightmost, it's, um, it's gonna come out soon, it's a metal jet. So currently we're doing a lot of things with stainless steel and, and you can actually print in metal and have the properties of metal. And metal is a uniquely difficult thing to do to some extent because it requires heat and it has, uh, it shrinks, it expands a lot more than plastic. Even here, right, it's not just about the printer, it's a lot more about creating a platform to the point of standardization than having a lot of software. There's terabytes and terabytes of data that comes out every time you build what build, meaning I'll show you in a video, but 
build meaning one batch of 3D printed parts. A lot of data comes out. What do you do with that? And how do you make your print process better by using analytics on it? That, that's super important. So we have that as a fundamental backbone for what we're doing. Quickly on use cases, we are focused on these four, transportation, industrial, medical, and consumer. On the consumer side, the bottom right, uh, I touched about it a little bit. We have uh, our group, my group, uh, is working with the 3D print group uh, on personalized custom footwear. But then all the others uh, also have some 3D scanning applications in there. A uh, lot of focus on transportation because they have lots of plastic parts that are kind of weird and very hard to manufacture and they cost a lot of money. But with 3D print, for example, something like this, it's super easy to make in 3D print. But if you have to do it with an uh, injection molding process, it's a lot more complicated. OK, a couple of quick videos. Um, the intention of these videos is to show you different types of 3D scanning and compare it to what we do. Essentially, if you have to boil down what our strength is at HP, we have 30 years of doing page-wide and large form factor printing. And what does that printing entail? It entails taking microscopic drops of fluid and precisely putting it in one location. Right? That's what printing is. You're putting a drop in exactly the same place every time reliably. And we took that IP and that talent, and we are using it in 3D print. And simplistically, the way it works is you have a powder, uh, like think about plastic powder. It's like powder. It's like talcum powder. It looks like powder. You take a very thin layer of that. Then you drop precise drops of fusing agents and a little bit of detailing agent on the corner. It's just precise drops. That's where our strength is. We can do it really fast because we can print really fast. Once you do that, you put heat on it, and then it fuses where we want it to fuse. The rest doesn't fuse, and you can just blow it away. And, and you do that layer by layer. So you do that fuse, you push it down, put another layer of powder, do the same thing, precisely put it. So you can get whatever shape you want. So the strength is not in laser, it's not extrusion is a different technology. Extrusion is what you would get if you go and buy a $500,000, $2,000 consumer 3D printer, right? It'd be like a big box with a coil of plastic. It heats it. Essentially, it's like soldering in some ways, right? It's melting the plastic and putting it layer by layer by layer. That's a very slow process. Here we are taking a huge bed, and at one fell swoop, one, one, uh, uh, one arm goes this way, and it puts the fluid exactly where you want. Another arm goes this way and heats it up, done, next. So it's super fast, so you will see that here. And I was telling Patrick earlier, I could spend hours explaining technology, but I tried not to do that. <laughs> this is how HP's proprietary area-wide processing compares with existing popular point processing technologies for building functional parts. In the time it takes these slower point processes to build 1,000 parts, HP's multi-jet fusion technology would have created several thousands of parts. Using HP's proprietary multi-agent printing, the HP multi-jet fusion technology achieves new levels of part quality at these breakthrough speeds. And then the next one goes into a little bit more detail on what I was talking about, La putting down a layer of product and then putting precise drops in exactly the place you want them to be. To produce truly functional parts, it's important to ensure that the material has been properly fused and that part edges are smooth and well-defined. To achieve part quality at speed, HP invented a multi-agent printing process. In this process, a fusing agent is applied on a material layer where the particles are meant to fuse together. A detailing agent is applied to modify fusing and create fine detail and smooth surfaces. The area is exposed to energy and reactions between the agents and the material cause the material to selectively fuse together to form the part. The fusing process requires accurate temperature control across the entire material layer. I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor of the technology. And now this is the final video, and I'm done with my talk. We can go into Q&A. But here, uh, when I first thought about 3D print, I, I didn't really know much about 3D print. Right? So it was very hard for me to conceptualize what exactly is happening until I saw it in action. So that's what I'm hoping to do here. 
So you can actually see it in action rather than just a more theoretical kind of concept. Introducing the HP JetFusion 3D printing solution, made up of a printer, build unit, and processing station with fast cooling. With a more efficient 3D printing workflow, now you can deliver functional parts up to 10 times faster at the lowest cost. The process begins with HP's easy-to-use software, which allows you to prepare the build to be printed, including error checking and automatic packing of your 3D models within the build chamber, before sending the job to print. For materials loading, the build unit is inserted into the HP JetFusion 3D processing station. Pre-packed HP materials cartridges are installed and quantity and mixing options selected. The materials transfer to the build unit in a clean and automated process before it is slotted into the printer so production can start. Pre-print and in-printer checks enable predictable quality output. HP's multi-jet fusion technology delivers extreme dimensional accuracy and optimal mechanical properties faster. And thanks to HP's unique multi-agent printing process, you have voxel by voxel control over each part. The material is contained within the HP Jet Fusion 3D build unit at all times, meaning the printer can easily switch between a range of different materials. The material is raised from inside the build unit and spread evenly across the build platform where the fusing process occurs. The build platform is then lowered layer by layer by precise mechanisms, which help ensure a high degree of dimensional accuracy. At any point during the printing process, you can monitor job status in the command center. The build unit is removed from the printer and taken to the processing station, and the second build unit installed, so you don't have to stop production. The HP JetFusion 3D processing station allows for cooling, unpacking, and mixing via semi-automatic, which helps reduce labor costs. Fast cooling speeds up the post-print process, and the powder is contained entirely within the processing unit, ensuring cleaner unpacking and materials reuse and mixing. During unpacking, a laminar airflow ensures all unused material is stored, ready to be recycled for the next job. Any remaining unused material can be recovered manually to provide the highest possible reusability rates. Once cooled and unpacked, the parts are ready for processing in a bead blast cabinet before any final finishes are applied. The unused powder is recycled and mixed with fresh material, and once the build unit is filled, the processing station is ready for the next job. The HP Jet Fusion 3D printing solution offers the possibility to print using different materials. The HP Jet Fusion 3D external tank provides the option to extract recycled material from the processing station, so it can be replaced with a different material. You can rely on HP's world-class services and support to maximize uptime and productivity. HP Jet Fusion 3D printing. Start producing more functional parts within the same day, up to 10 times faster and at the lowest cost. back to core growth future, right? We talked about the core business, uh, touched upon 3D printing and then 3D scan. And I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I know we could uh, we went a little bit longer than I had hoped for, but yeah. Uh, the cartridges really remind me of like inkjet yeah. cartridges, like right. they look really cute. Right. Uh, I'm but they are very large, right? Very it's large. relative to the person, yeah. Right, but I'm curious like how um, you take sort of the reference to traditional printers mm -hmm. as part of your design strategy for right. sort of accessibility and training. Oh, got it. No, the, the good news is that a lot of our engineers and business leaders on 3D print come from that world, from the printing world, and because of the fundamental nature of the technology, right? Pre precisely placing the, uh, drops of fluid. So in some ways, subconsciously, it probably was designed that way. Plus, it's also for speed, right? You want it to be like a cartridge, so you can put it in, pull it out, because it's not a, as soon as you pull it out, you're not done. You still got to do cooling and cleaning and blasting. You got to do some steps to, to get it ready. So you want to be able to take things out and keep the machine in operation. The most important thing is asset utilization, because these are expensive machines, $200,000, $300,000 type of machines. So you want to make sure they're constantly being used. So to, to do that, you, you only have to be using them when you need to be using them. When, 
when this machine is printing, that machine is loading. When this machine is done, you pull it out, you put the next one, and then you put another one in there. And so you, there is lot, you can keep using the machines continuously. That's the whole intention. In some ways, for the people using 3D print, it's not, uh, it's not the traditional printing customer to some extent. You're trying to teach somebody who is doing um, uh, injection molding, which is a completely different process, to do this. So there's a different challenge there, but uh, having the same kind of form factor, it just seems like it blew up. It's, I think, definitely helps. I, I don't think it was consciously done, but it's done for practical reasons. And then, obviously, if you are the, if you, if you came from that background, you're more likely to do it because that's how, what you understand. You talk about how like designers need to think about as well in like, in three D design right. and, and to use leverage the, the technology. Right. Can HP affect that? Like help designers to think. The design in, in a different way, or on how does it combine so, so designers today already use, like if you think about traditional designers, let's say you're doing a, a commercial for Coke, and you, and you want to do some design around it. You, you want to put the Coke can in a way so that you can manipulate it. You, you might want to change lighting, which way the light comes. So the lo it's a lot easier to do it with a 3D object. So you're taking 3D, inserting into a 2D, and then having an output. The video, if you remember, the bear with the ram shield and all that you saw with Z3D, that, that one is actually a, a poster for some product, right? But it's a 2D poster. It's going to be in a magazine or in a TV commercial. But that one was all done in 3D because they have to do it so you can actually say, ah, I don't like the bear this way, change it this way. But if you're a designer who did it by hand, then, you have, then it takes a lot more time if you don't have a 3D model. So a lot of things are done in 3D already. And the printing side? Also, like using the, the 3D, like the designs that help leverage the 3D printer technology. Uh -huh. Do you think HP has a role there in terms of helping them thinking about set of right. different pieces merging together? One right, right. So today, um, if you think about 3D print, the way, way we are going after, we are not going after the consumer. We are starting off with the big mass production. Like we want to disrupt the $12 trillion market. We don't want to go after, try to do uh, market creation for consumers. It's a lot difficult, right? The idea is that once you get really good at and solve a lot of the problems in the big productions thing, you can trickle the technology down. Starting from bottom up, you will start with uh, extrusion, like you saw. It's super slow, right? It's a lot harder to start from there and move up than take the powders. And imagine, like, in 10 years, you could have a home version of this, which is, to her point, it will look like something you know. You're putting in a cartridge, and then it does something, but it do does it much slower than this, but it can do it, right? But you won't get there till you learn how to do it in mass production. You can take all the savings and technology and invest it back. In terms of materials, you talked about you um, learning more about metals and everything. Right. How limited is it today, the technology, to right. one certain type of plastic, right. or, or where could they grow? Right, right. There, we have lots of materials today. Mostly on the plastic side, we use polyamide, so it's like thermoplastic. Or we have one called PA12. It has certain properties for, like, a, one of them is more rigid, one of them is more flexible, one of them has better, better properties on certain dimensions. Right? We have limited it today to, to a certain palette, and on metals, it will keep growing also. But that goes to my point of you have to keep doing more and more and more on materials so you can do more. For example, initially it was you could get any color you want except uh, as long as it's black, right, like the Ford model. The, everything was black. But now we have colors. But the, we started off slowly. We are starting off as a prototyping kind of thing, more around education, where you can do a heart with multiple colors and stuff like that. But in mass production, it's still uh, uh, some way to go. So that, that's kind of how we're playing it. We start with something, get really good at it, and then we move, on, move to trying to do everything. Uh, again, to my earlier point with Jose, was I don't, uh, we don't want to uh, try to do everything all at once, and we want to uh, intersect the production market, right? So ma a mass production market. So there, you have to be very good at whatever you're doing. It's better to do one thing really well than try to do everything poorly. And then you won't get a second chance. So that's why we are very focused on certain materials now. But we completely understand we need to do a lot more materials. On metals, for example, I talked about stainless steel. But you can do metals with, uh, there are so many metals. Right? You can do it with gold. Some 3D printers do it with gold. But what is the mass production use case? Not many, right? But in theory, you could do jewelry out of it. You could do amazing jewelry out of it. You don't need to have, have to chisel it. 
But is the market really ready for that today? Not quite. So that, that's the kind of thing. Where we can intersect now, but anything we learn here, we can reuse it. Yeah, so you mentioned that HP is moving into metal 3D printing. Yes. I want to know more about, like, uh, so there is powder for ceramic, uh, right. for making ceramic components. So what I guess, what's the material used for the Currently, the one I showed you, that's stainless steel. Like, you crush it, like? Yeah, it's, a, it's like a powder. Everything is a powder. It's the same exact kind of technology, but it's, it comes in a powder form, then you fuse it, same exact kind of idea. Okay. So I'm assuming that like, making a powder out of stainless steel would be like, no, not really. Not really. It exists. It exists. Yeah, that use stainless steel. So it's, it's steel is easy, and a lot of people are already doing it. So the, again, the trick is you don't want to invent a new material yourself because that'll take. Um, you you don't want to set up the infrastructure for it. You don't want to start owning steel mills. But uh, what you want to do is make sure at least some materials exist, and then you can do some commercial applications. Like steel, for example, you can use to make this. This is a real world application. Whereas if you do some exotic metal, what's the point? Probably one, one last question. All right. Uh, is HP doing any research on developing these two biological materials? Yes, but I can't talk about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we are, we are thinking about, uh, again, uh, this goes back to the same point. We can put fluids in exactly the same location at, at exactly the same time in the same quantity, right? So we can do a lot of things in uh, microfluidics kind of thing. So we, uh, not this technology precisely, but the same kind of uh, IP and know-how we can use in medical. That's uh, all we have time for. All right. I just want to thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Thank you. Awesome.